I'm standing this close to you. You been vaccinated? No, negative. Oh, okay. Then we can <laughs> hang out. You do you, boo. I need y'all to know that I walked all the way from across the street to see y'all. So now, don't, don't walk off from me like that. This week on the show, I'm talking about um, Beyonce. Oh. Y'all big fans of Beyonce? I enjoy. Yeah, I like her. She is like the mom that everybody looks up to. Like her old man, I better. Don't like you her don't. Okay, what, what's the deal with her old man? Because we're gonna talk about him too. I'm a, I'm a child of God, so talk to me. Can I talk to you on that level? He ain't right. But when you say he ain't right, what do you mean? The frequency of music that he does is um, on um, evil frequency. We made a lot of the stuff is out in the open. We just some people just are blind to see it. There's no respect for women. Okay. There's no respect for law enforcement. Yes. There's no respect for each other. Yes. And and that's there's no respect for our nation. The devil's very real. Okay. But the devil's my bitch. And I mean, I'm from South Dakota. There's lots of horses. <laughs> what about a white horse? I mean, didn't you ever watch The Wizard what of Oz? What about a white? You see where I'm going? I don't care about anything else and but music. That's what I wanted to know. There's some biblical prophecy that's happening right now, like Euphrates River's drying up, and that's in Revelations. And they says the four angels abounded in that river and they're about to be released. I think anyone at any time can pick anything from the Bible and make it towards their time. God bless them, God bless them, but they're Ooh, Got something to say, you wanted to play. They come running my way and ruin G status is dead. No, ready to go, about to go in, you already know. Got my instructions, now give me your audience, hand me your mic and I'm ready to blow. One for the money, two for the show. For everybody who encouraged me to go, 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 get it We finally did it, I ain't never turning back Shawty, I'm fully committed, committed to my beliefs I'm committed to the city I'm about to give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for And now, from a booby-trapped treehouse In an oak tree, in the George Washington National Forest It's the prize fighter of the puzzle The chugger of hugger mugger the Catch-22 comedian and the host of Jim Spiracy, Jimmy Dodds. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Jim Spiracy. I'm your host, James D. Dodds. And for some of you that don't know, the D stands for doggone it, God is good all the time. And all the time, I'm here to tell you that God is good. Also, let me tell you this, that this show is dedicated to the preservation of the word of God. And he said, and I quote, he said, we're two or more gathered in my name. He said, there am I. So do the math. I'm here, you here. So guess what? He's here. So uh, let's get blessed y'all. Now, hold up, before I get started, I have to address a little situation uh, I need to address a little thing with uh, Miss Christine Luke. Okay, for those of you that don't know, uh, Christine, she's the president of the Jim Spiracy fan club. You know, Christine has been in this thing from day, day, uh, day one. She's been giving me words of encouragement from the onset. She's given me ideas for the show. She's invited me to her hometown of Minnesota. And she knows I'm black. Okay, so Christine is what I personally call good peoples. Okay, now having said that, Christine, of all the messages you sent me last week, okay, at no time did you think to send me one message that said the words to the effect of something just telling me that, hey man, you got Sasquatch running around loose in your cave. Nobody wanted to tell me. Y'all kept seeing me on the show, grabbing my nose. Nobody wanted to say nothing. Christine, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you want this job, you are gonna have to take the unenviable position of telling me uncomfortable truths just like that. Now, on the other hand, Ty Jackson from Kansas City, okay, evidently, she ain't got no shame to her game because she immediately inboxed me immediately after the show and said, and I quote, yo, straight up, fam, you got a booger in your nose. Now, for you, Miss Jackson, let me tell you something. No, it wasn't a booger. Okay, it was a gray hair. 
okay? But nonetheless, I got it taken care of, y'all. I got it taken care of, okay? All right? Granted, it was hot outside. Granted, I had to get up in there and do some yard work, but uh, I told y'all, God is good all the time, and, you know, thanks to Home Depot, they had hedge clippers on sale. So I got up in there and got the work done, and I'm, I'm looking good, okay? But listen here. Don't look, don't don't feel don't don't feel no kind of way because y'all y'all act like y'all think I don't know I got a big nose. I do. Hey, I'm like sir nose. What he say? Uh uh, my nose is big. No, I'm not ashamed. Big like a pickle. Still getting paid. Look at man. Let me tell y'all something. This nose right here. This nose is a big part of my Mandingo heritage. Okay. Let me tell you something. When I worked at Fox. Marcellus Wiley used to call me Nostral Domus. Okay? When I worked at the Sheriff's Department, they used to tell me that when I leaned back and went to sleep, they used to say that my the front of my nose looked like the front end of a Dodge Ram pickup. Okay? So I'm telling you, you can't hurt me. I'm, I'm, I'm good with this. I'm used to it. So don't worry about hurting my feelings. If you ever see that happen again, you immediately send me a message and tell me, okay? But nonetheless, I'm good now. I got my problems taken care of. I ain't got to worry about it feeling like I got dragonflies flying in my nose while this show's going on. Um, nonetheless, listen here. My guest tonight on the show tonight, and there's no pun intended, but I'm gonna tell you, my guest tonight really knows his Bible. Okay, y'all see what I did there? He really knows his Bible. See, that was, that's what they call a seg leg. You know, I just rolled that in there like that. Anyway, my guest today is named Dr. K. Preston. You can go look him up on his website, drkpreston.com. Dr. Preston has written over 30 books. He's also going to be the author of the book, The Last Days Identified. And I need him to come in here and tell me if he feels that we are truly living in the last days or just exactly what's going on. By the way, some of you guys, you know this, some of you don't, but I suffer from dysplasia. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I tried to commit suicide and I jumped behind a bus, meaning sometimes I get stuff switched around, just like on tonight's show, okay? So I'm gonna do tonight's show in reverse, meaning, I'm going to give you a Bible story. I'm going to give you that quick Bible fix first. And then I'm going to go into the show. Okay? Y'all got that? So I'm going to give you a little Bible. And then I'm going to come back. All right? And we're going to get on into the show, right? So on that note right there, hey, DJ, do me a favor, man. Hit, 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 hit that Bible music for me. Right? And we'll be right back. Oh, yeah. Like I said before, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Man, I thank all of y'all for tuning into this show, sticking with this show, man. We've reached 500 subscribers. To some people, that's not a lot. For me, that's a lot. I would like to have more. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you watching the show. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, Having said all of that, let's go ahead and get to the Bible story, okay? The Bible story today that I'm going to bring to you, this story is going to come from the book of Reservations, okay? It's coming from the book of Reservations, chapter 6, okay? And if you turn to that book, you're going to find that it speaks of the four horsemen. Now, we've all heard the talk about the four horsemen. You know, if I ask you who's the four horsemen, you know, everybody knows who the four horsemen is. Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson, Tully Blanchard, and their manager, James Day Dillon. Okay? But no, I'm not talking about them. 
for my por porcelain friends out there. Yes, I'm talking about the four horsemen that was mentioned in the Metallica album. Okay. That's who I'm talking about. Now, let me just add this right here as I go to tell the story. For some reason, this little Bible story here, this Bible story here is like what Cat Williams, you know what Cat Williams says? This, th th this stuff right here, this one right here, hey man, this one right here, people didn't want to talk to me about. Not even my mama wanted to talk to me about this. I called mama and said, mama, look, uh, I'm going to do a story about the four horsemen. Tell me about the four horsemen. Mm-mm. <laughs> okay, Lord. <laughs> Did y'all just hear that thunder? <laughs> anyway, listen, I called my mama. I said, mama, I said, tell me something about these four horsemen. Uh, I want to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. And my mama said, and I quote, Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Miss me with that. Huh? What you mean? She said, I don't fool with that one. No, baby. I go right past that one. I don't mess with that. I asked two preachers. and Both of them told me. Good topic. But uh, neither of them will come on here and talk about it. Okay. That's why I got our guest today. At least he did come on and say he would talk about it. But, uh, just due to the fact that I was, people didn't want to talk about. It. I knew that there had to be something more to this story regarding regarding these the uh, the four horsemen. Okay, so having said that, man, let me give you a quick little backdrop on this story. Okay, now, like I said, we're talking about the Book of Revelations. Now, the Book of Revelations was written by Saint John. Saint John was a hundred years old. Okay, and Saint John was one of the apostles. Okay, you know, Jesus had 12 apostles. Of those 12 apostles, St. John was the only one that didn't get murked. Shanked. He's the only one that didn't get that business. In other words, I'm saying he's the only one that didn't get killed. Okay, now one time, one time they did catch John slipping. And bruh, they tried to boil him. And he miraculously was saved okay now let me tell you this too also when we talk about john john was the only one of jesus's homies that stayed by his side when he was being crucified john was the homie that jesus said hey man look after my mama huh that's who John was. So all of y'all said up and talking about y'all don't want to listen. Y'all don't want to read revelations. Y'all don't, y'all don't want to hear what John had to say. Man, y'all need to recognize who John was and the work that John put in and who, what John represented to Jesus and what he represented. Okay. Okay. So, and I also, now check this out. I think that for his loyalty to Jesus, God appreciated how he looked out for his son. So he let him have the last word in the Bible. He said, hey man, I'm gonna let you have the final say so. And that's why he gave him the book of Revelations, okay? Y'all see how I did that? Y'all like that a little bit, huh? All right, man, anyway, man, go to chapter six, man. Chapter six starts with a lamb opening, it says seals. So you could say that it's a, He's opening an envelope. He's opening something and he's revealing, you know, it could just be like an iPad. Book, and he's showing it to him. Okay. He's opening these seals and it, he's opened seven. They're not looking too good. They're horrible things that are going on. And as he's opening them up, he can tell that there are things that are going on with the world. Okay. And first of all, there are four beings riding these horses okay and they're that's why they're called the four horsemen and the horses are red white and black and pale okay those are the horses red white black and pale now the red horse the red horse represents war the rider had a sword to take the peace from the land. Now, 
there's a lot of people that are worried right now and they think that that red horse they think that that represents russia in the bible uh we used to call russia the red menace you know so there's a lot of people that think that then there's the white horse and the rider of that horse is carrying a bow he has a crown and i guess he represents conquering some solid some scholars say that this rider represents christ some say it represents the antichrist I'm here to tell you straight up, that's messed up right there. And uh, we don't need to be getting those two confused. And uh, we need to get some clarity upon what's happening on that white horse. Okay. Also, on the black horse, the rider is carrying a set of scales. And it said that the scales had barley and wheat. And said that it represented famine, hunger starvation you know kind of just adding a new meaning to the term starving to death just having said that and you're cracking a little joke but have you seen the prices of groceries these days in these stores we do realize that no matter where you turn on the news they're talking about food shortages you realize every day we turn on the news, the value of the dollar is dropping more and more. Man, what are we going to do when the dollar has no value? Oh, yeah, I forgot one more horse. It's the pale horse. And it said that when the, de when the pale horse came, death was its rider. And hell follow close behind him or her those four horses those four horsemen those are the first four seals that the lamb opens now a lot of us you know there's three more seals i told you there was seven <laughs> after those four after those four right there, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I couldn't have died, man. I'm good. I need to take a break. Don't show me nothing else. I would have I would have tapped out. I would have tell somebody, man, somebody else come look at this. But anyway, on that fifth seal, man, the, the fifth seal, it's about people being killed for the sake of Christ. And the sixth seal, it talks about earthquakes talks about the sun going black and it talks about the moon looking like blood let me ask y'all a question man have we ever seen the sun go black have we ever seen the moon get red and I think they even call it a blood moon don't they and John says the seventh seal for two chapters later in the Bible, chapter eight, John talks about angels coming to pour out the wrath of God. Now, I don't want to be on the receiving end of any wrath that God is pouring out. Now, I'm not a biblical scholar, nor do I profess to be. But I do believe that there is a reason that God chooses to call it his wrath. And I'm going to tell you right now, the question that people want to know, that everybody wants to know, they want to know, have these things already happened? Or is this just simply a sign of things to come? Now, the Bible clearly states that no man would know the hour nor the day. So in other words, it's a little complicated, okay? And I'm hoping to have a guest that'll come on here and provide us with a little bit more clarity about this whole thing. Uh, we're going to be right back with Mr. Don K. Preston on Jim Spiracy.
I'll haul. The Book of Revelation, also known as the Book of the Apocalypse. No part of the Bible is as mysterious or as controversial. It's the last book of scripture, and it's believed by most to represent prophecies about the end of time. Written by St. John in his old age, it contains terrifying imagery of wars, catastrophes, famines, and a beast called the Antichrist. While all Christians agree that there will be a happy ending ruled by Jesus Christ himself, the times leading up to that sound like literal hell on earth. Thousands of books have attempted to interpret the book of Revelations, and the answers go in every possible direction. Some say the book is mere allegory. Some say the events already happened with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But most Christians fear the book of Revelations predict a horrible future, one that could be on the very near horizon. As terrifying as the apocalypse may be, we here at Jim Spiracy have decided to wade into this debate and investigate. All right. As I told you earlier, uh, my guest tonight, uh, I am so honored to have him here. His name is Don K. Preston. I choose to call him Mr. Don K. Preston, but uh, he has informed me that uh, he is just simply Don K. Preston. Uh, he's our guest tonight. Uh, Don has written over 33 books. And he is also the author of The Last Days Identified. Uh, you can reach him at his website at donkpreston.com. Uh, Don, uh, before we even get started here, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about you, sir? Uh, where do you want me to start? <laughs> uh, well, let, let's know. start with that word I asked you about earlier when I asked you about did you have a doctoring? You had a, you had a word that you used. What was that word? I have an honorary doctorate, a doctor of divinity, okay. uh, doctorate, which was bestowed upon me. Uh, took me totally by surprise, I must say, when I, when the university contacted me and said they wanted to bestow a, an honorary doctorate on me. Right. So they, okay. they told me the, uh, you know, the uh, head of the university told me I should be called Dr. Don Preston, but I have never felt comfortable with titles. And so I'm Don. Okay. Listen, I've watched you. I've listened to you. You are, you, I, I would consider you to be quite knowledgeable of the Bible. You have a, you have a quite, ex, you're, you're, you're very well versed in the Bible. Um, which is the reason I wanted you here today, man, just to kind of help us out just with everything that's going on in the world today. I mean, just, you know, and, and, and everybody kind of has an idea of what's going on. And this is, I just wanted to speak with someone that could just maybe, you know, but maybe shed some light on our audience. First of all, can you tell me what is, what's the deal with Gog and Magog? My, what's the deal with that? Uh, nothing in so far as, our modern world is concerned. Uh, I I know that my goodness gracious, uh, the so-called prophecy experts of the day of anywhere of uh, Tim LaHaye who recently passed away, Thomas Ice, uh, most of those they believe that we're standing on on the very cusp of Russia invading Israel, and it's all about supposedly Gog and Magog, and that's uh, you know they base what they claim on Ezekiel 38 and 39, which in my estimation is a total distortion. And if I can even use the word, kind of a strong word, but I believe it's accurate. They they really pervert Ezekiel 38 and 39. Mm. Okay. Uh, how so? Could you just elaborate on that real quick? Certainly. Uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is set within an ancient uh an ancient context. One of the greatest problems that we face in Bible interpretation these days is a failure to honor audience relevance. Audience relevance. What did the text mean to the people to whom the text was written? And, 
you know, the folks who say who are saying we're looking for Gog and Magog, they rip these two chapters out of its ancient historical uh, context and say, oh, well, okay, Ezekiel may have been written in the 6th century BC, but it's applying to us today. And they ignore, they literally ignore the, the markers, what I call the markers, uh, in the text of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which in regard to the war, they were going to use bows and arrows. They were going to use spears. They were going to be riding horses. They were going to have shields. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that we're not going to see any modern warfare with the combatants using bows and arrows and swords and shields and riding horses. That's not modern warfare. Okay, now Russia did have a war a few years ago where uh, I think they were fighting Afghanistan. They were fighting them on camels. Yeah, camels are not horses, but you know. <laughs> uh, and by the way, they, they were not using bows and arrows. They were not using swords and shields. They were using, they were using the very helicopters. Yeah, they were using helicopters, and uh, they were using the very best technology that they had. That is absolutely not what Ezekiel 38 and 39 says. And, you know, uh, the folks that I mentioned, uh, in fact, I was reading an article on the Internet today uh, about this individual. I've forgotten his name at the moment. And he was saying, we're seeing prophecy unfold right in front of our eyes. And yet he pointed out, guess what? That the names that are used in Ezekiel 38 uh, of, of the countries that would be in confederacy with uh, Gog, Magog, not one of those kingdoms, not one of those nations exists today. And this guy admitted that. Well, hey, if none of the kingdoms that Ezekiel 38 and 39 says we're going to be involved in the battle of Gog and Magog, if they don't exist today, then don't you think it's a little bit anachronistic to say it's those kingdoms that are going to be involved in a war today? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Is Gog and Magog, is that the same as Armageddon? It, in most commentaries, there is a direct correlation they believe that they are the same. And in the ancient Jewish commentators, there was a direct, uh, in fact, the ancient uh, rabbinic commentators did not mention Armageddon per se. That's almost a New Testament uh, terminology found in Revelation chapter 16. But they associated it with, uh, you know, the, the, the end time battle. Yeah. Uh, I, saw, I saw an interview that you did and man you said something that i had so much re I, I i i had so much respect for you for saying you said that uh, you don't fear the antichrist you don't fear tribulation you don't fear five million people dying you know there's a lot of people out there don that can't say that now you know they they, oh, they can't say that Oh, that's an understatement. I am contacted by people almost weekly who are literally living in fear of Armageddon. They're, they're living in fear of the Great Tribulation. And let me share something really, really quick. And I wrote a little book uh, some years ago entitled Blast from the Past, The Truth About Armageddon. And anyway, in Revelation chapter 7, we read about 144,000 Jews out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And John was asked by the angel, who are these? And John says, don't have a clue. That's, that's Preston's paraphrase, you understand. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and uh, so the angel said, well, these are those who come out of the great tribulation. Okay, so we got 144,000 who come out of the great tribulation. Well, in Revelation chapter 14, which reiterates and repeats the scene, John sees the 144,000 again. The angel asked him again, who are these? And John says, don't have a clue. You tell me. And the angel says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. These are the first fruits of those 
redeemed to God from man. Okay, wait a minute. These 144,000 are the first fruits of the redeemed, the redeemed through Christ. Well, guess what that means? That means they're first century Christians. That means the Great Tribulation was in the first century. See, there you go. That's why I don't... That, that's why I don't fear the great tribulation or the abomination of desolation or the man of sin, because here is the book of Revelation telling us the 144,000 experienced the great tribulation, but the 144,000 were the very first generation of Jewish Christians, which had to be in the first century. Okay. You know, I'm not real uh, smart sometimes. I'm not real, real smart. And especially I'm not good at math. Okay. Uh, I, I okay. sometimes tell people anything beyond two plus two equals five and I'm lost. Okay. <laughs> and so, but this is real easy. Great tribulation. Break it first down. First generation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great tribulation. First generation of Christians. That means first century generation. Great tribulation. I mean, that's bingo. One plus one equals two. Uh, get, get, give them some time. They're going to try to change it. But right now, one plus one still <laughs> equals two. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, if I may take you well, back real quick. If I can take you back real quick, Don, because you were talking about Russia. And, and we're talking about, come on, you, you, you can understand why people are being a little paranoid. You know, people have that, you know, people have this tendency to when they think that they're to meet their maker, that they want to start trying to get right and read, you know, their Bible. Uh, th th this whole Russia thing, you know, you said yourself that this Russia thing is some serious stuff, right? Uh, yeah. Russia just recently formed some type of deal with Iran and Turkey. Uh, could you explain that? And could they be possibly feeling some type of prophecy that they don't know about? Well, number one, I don't believe that Russia is overly concerned with fulfilling Bible prophecy. And Turkey uh, and Syria have no interest whatsoever in the Bible. They're Muslims. They do not believe in the Bible. Uh, now, as Muslims, they do have an eschatology, by the way. And there is some overlap between Islamic eschatology uh, and Christian eschatology. Uh, there are wide, wide, wide differences, how, however. By the way, a friend of mine wrote a book recently, if I could give a plug for that, and it's called The Armageddon Deception uh, by Mike Sullivan. Mike okay. has done an incredible job of laying out the Islamic eschatology, what it predicted, when it said it would take place, demonstrating that it failed. It's powerful stuff. Uh, you can get the book on Amazon, and again, it is Armageddon Deception by Mike Sullivan. Uh, I highly, highly recommend the book. It's a pretty good-sized book, but it's more than worth the time, the effort, and the cost uh, to get it. Now, uh, insofar as Putin, Syria, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. See, in order for that to have relevance for us today, a person has to be able to prove that Ezekiel 38 and 39 actually foretold our days. That's the main obstacle. But again, Russia is not found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Syria is not there. And one of these uh, articles that I was reading today admits it. Now, le let me go back over what I said a moment ago, okay? Okay. The, the nations that are listed, and I, I've got my Bible open here to Ezekiel 38. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. I'll say something about that in a moment. Uh, okay. Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. Okay, so here's what happens. And I was a young man. I mean, I was a, you know, I'm a, I was in my teenager years, I guess, when I very first heard about Russia being Rosh. And it's like, whoa, that sounds impressive. Well, here's the deal. Rosh means prince. That's all it means. It means prince. It means head. Uh, and notice that it says, and some translations have tried to correct this misunderstanding, 
but it's against Rosh Mesek. It is literally, in the Hebrew, it is the chief prince of Mesek. And Michael Heiser, who is one of the most foreknown biblical scholars of our world, unbelievable scholar, his expertise is in the ancient Near Eastern uh, history, uh, the text, and what have you. And he says there has never been found not one single mention of a land by the name of Rosh. That is a modern, uh, that's a modern name. Rosh is not even a name. It's an adjective. It's not a noun. It's an adjective. It's the chief prince of Meshach. So there's number one problem. When people say, oh, look, look what's happening with Putin over there, his invasion of Ukraine. And by the way, I wrote a couple, couple of articles when, um, when Putin invaded the Ukraine and all the prophecy pundits, you know, were going, oh, this is it. This is Gog and Magog. Armageddon is just around the corner. Uh, those articles can be found on my website, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com. Just, you know, go to the search bar and search in Ukraine, Gog, Magog, etc., etc. And I've got a lot of really, really careful historical and biblical documentation to show that the modern prophecy, and you use the word Holy Ghost, uh, which is a really good word, paranoia. Okay. Is, that's, that's a very apt word because people are so upset about it. So what do we have? We have people getting upset over Russia. They run over to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say, see, it says Rosh. Just because you got a word, an ancient word, that sounds like a modern word, doesn't mean they're the same thing. You know, Chin in Chinese means leader, ruler. What does Chin mean in English? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It Now, they sound similar, but they have nothing whatsoever in common. And once we understand the importance, to go back to what I said a moment ago, audience relevance. What, what would the people in Ezekiel's day who read this text, would they be thinking about a country that did not exist and would not exist? For a thousand for a thousand years and more, how are they going to understand this? Son of man, here's what you say. Yeah, son of man, here's what you're supposed to say to the people of your day. Tell them here's what's going to happen. Okay, and he says, okay, speak to them about Rosh. They've never heard the word Rosh. All they know, they know the word Rosh because it's in Hebrew. But to them, Rosh did not mean land. It meant a chief captain of, in this case, Meshach. That's all it meant. Meshach is the one that, that is involved here. It is not some guy or some country named Rosh. And certainly not a country named Russia. Named Russia. Okay, yeah. tell me this. Does the Bible predict anything beyond 100 AD? I don't believe so. Uh, I am what you call a full preterist, and I take Jesus' words very, very seriously when predicting the fall of hold Jerusalem. On, hold on, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Excuse okay. me, Don. Do me a favor. Our audience is not made up of Bible scholars. Okay. <laughs> okay. My audience is just red blooded. GED card carrying Americans. Okay, <laughs> would you please would you please elaborate on that for me one more time? I certainly will. Preterist is from a Latin word means pretero. Uh okay, you also know that word. you're gonna scare the hell out of a lot of people just by saying that. <laughs> just because no, I'm trying. Oh no, I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist, I ain't no preterist. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I I, I want to get Go this ahead. down. I want to get this down where the calves can get it so that the cows can eat it too. Okay. There you go, please. That, 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 so that's, that's my audience. Saying. Go for it. 
Okay, that, that's what I'm saying. I said I'm a full preterist. I'm a guy, let me put it as simply as possible, that believes all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in, fulfilled in AD 70. Here's one of a gazillion reasons why. In, des, in describing the fall of Jerusalem, that virtually everyone agrees he was talking about, in Luke 21, 20 to 24, Jesus said, these be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. Now, that's pretty powerful stuff. All things written must be fulfilled. Now, remember, everybody that I know of, and, you know, well, let me take that back. There, there are a few folks out there that don't, but every scholar that I'm aware of agrees that Jesus was describing the coming fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. If we grant that, again, as most do, okay. Okay. then here he is saying, these be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. And there, pardon me, there are all sorts of supporting passages of scripture in the Bible. And look, I wasn't raised believing in what I believe right now, right? I hope you understand that. I, I was raised as a fifth generation member uh, of what's known as the all millennial world that's in the churches of Christ, that's in the reformed community and, and what have you. Uh, I believe that we were in the millennium. I believe that we're expecting Christ to come one day, uh, burn the earth up, you know, and take everybody to heaven with him. Uh, that, that's the way I was raised. I believed it. I taught it. I even debated from that perspective. But, okay, I but soon are, just, are, are we saying that that day's or is that day not coming? No, sir. He was describing the it's fall not. of Jerusalem in AD 70. In Luke 21, 20 or 24. I'm sorry, verse 22. OK, now, see, here's the problem when you say it, because if you say that, then you, that's going to make people run back out here and start acting a fool because they think they still <laughs> got some more time. You know what I'm saying? Really? Who we got to hey. see right now? People is people are thinking that you know. And if do me a favor, matter of fact, we're gonna take that part out the show. I don't even want people knowing you say that. I like the fact that they think. That they <laughs> don't think you do that? Don't you do that? <laughs> no. Here, here's the deal. <laughs> here's the deal. If we have to be motivated by fear and fear alone to do what's right. For the God who loves us and gave his son for us, we ain't being motivated by the right thing. Okay. Paul said, Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us that if we, right. and, and we thus judge, Paul said, if one died for all, all were dead. So that from now on, those who live should not live unto themselves. In other words, go running out and partying up. but to live unto him who died and rose again. For Paul, okay. the motivation for, for living right, doing good, loving our neighbor, being good citizens, being the kind of people we ought to be, was not based upon fear. Now, make no mistake, Paul feared the judgment of God. Okay. He didn't want to be cut off from God. But his main motivating factor, and ours ought to be, because God loves us, Christ has loved us, Christ gave himself for us, and if he gave himself for us, then I can surely, <laughs> I mean, let's face it, if Christ was willing to die for me, I can surely find up enough courage to do some things that are right in this life in order to glorify him. You would think. You would think I, I shouldn't I, I shouldn't have to have a head or a hammer laying on top of my head and saying, listen, boy, you don't if you don't do what's right, I'm going to womp you with this thing. We shouldn't have to have that. Now, I understand some people are motivated like that. But it's not the best motivation. But but we do agree that that is the pretense of some of the laws that religion has used with us they, they've they used oh. kind of that strategy you know that oh yeah no no question tactic well let, let me go a little bit deeper into this okay okay men are motivated by one of three things 
they're motivated by fear. fear. They're motivated by by hope of reward, or they're motivated and divorce. by love. Child support. <laughs> well, okay, you see that that's fear. That's fear. That's fear. <laughs> that's fear. That's fear. That's I'm fear. telling you. <laughs> okay. That, that, okay. And it works. Yeah. In Second Corinthians, okay, chapter four and five, the apostle used all three of those motivating factors that psychologists have recognized for for forever. These are the three motivating factors. Now you can break those down into subsets and all this kind of stuff like that. It's not the point. Paul said that our light affliction, which is only for a moment, works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's a hope of reward. Okay? okay. So Paul then said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the man who has these promises, and that's the promise of fellowship with God, cleanses himself of all unrighteousness. In other words, Paul says, you know what? What Christ has for me, what Christ and the Father will do for me if I would just live for him is so far greater than any pleasure that I might have in this world by going out and living after the flesh. So my hope of heaven, my hope of being pleasing to God is number one motivating factor. Number two, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So there you go. That's what you were talking about a few moments ago. And look, I I used to be a hellfire damnation preacher when I was a young boy, when I was a young guy. Uh, they, they used to say of me, that boy, speaking about me, that boy can skin a cat 12 different ways. Because, man, when I got in the pulpit, I cut loose. Well, I bet, I bet Peter, I bet Peter was upset at you. <laughs> well, I suspect that the father was pretty upset with me also at the same time, because uh, I just used to beat people over the head like crazy with this fear factor, you know, fear factor. If you if you ain't right, if you ain't doing right, if you had done all, you know, crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's and boy, you're going to hell. That's all there is to it. So okay, hold on, hold on, Don. I got to stop you right there, all right? Because I, I have okay. a list of questions I want to ask you, but I got to stop <laughs> you right there because I got to ask a question about what you just said about being that okay. type of preacher, because that's yeah. that's what I was raised up in. That's that, that's the way I was raised. You don't have those preachers now. Nowadays, every preacher that I hear speaking, God wants everyone to be prosperous. God wants everyone. I don't think, according to preaching now, you have to change any ways of your life. I mean, there, there's no hell and brimstone now. I mean, is there, there? there's a difference in old school preaching and what's going on now. Uh, is that right or wrong? Oh, you're absolutely right. We, we, twin, we have a tendency to go from tw pendulum swing to pendulum swing. What you just said is absolutely right. Uh, we we have the majority of preachers standing in the pulpit today. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just get have a great big group hug and saying, come by y'all. That is not biblical preaching. And keep the seats biblical filled. Oh, well, unfortunately, they're not filled I'm with sorry. the right motivation. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Now, there, the other pendulum swing is what I was guilty of when I was a young minister, and that is there is no preaching of God's love. There's no preaching of God's grace. There's no preaching of God's mercy. And so we, we have to try as ministers to bring those pendulum swings into the middle and do what Paul did. Paul said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to preach the reward I'm going to tell people that God, what God has in store for us, if we simply obey him, is so far beyond what we are able to imagine that it can't even be described. Number two, I warn them, I warn them, <laughs> if you refuse this, there is a price to be paid. Number three, I tell them, you know what, if you have the right kind of love, even the hope of reward kind of fades in the background. And certainly the fear of punishment fades in the background. Look, my wife and I have been married 53 years. God okay. 
And I can't even begin to tell you what an incredible blessing my wife is to me. She is literally my, my rock. She's my best friend. What, whatever positive adjective you'd like to use, that's my, that's my lady, okay? My motivation for, quote, faithfulness to her, which has never wavered for one moment of our married life, my motivation has never been fear of bringing down her wrath on me, although that would be considerable, I can assure you. <laughs> but, it. Yeah, but that's never been my main motivation. My, my main motivation has never even been hope of reward from her. My motivation has been, I love her. Now, because I love her, the worst thing in this world that I can imagine is losing her. Okay. Likewise, right. if we love the Lord, the worst thing that we could possibly fear is losing our relationship with the Lord. And because we have that love, I don't find it hard at all. And, and I say this with all sincerity. I have never once looked at another woman. And I know that makes me exceptional in the world that we live in today, in which over 55% of men admit to cheating on their wives. I've never been tempted for even one moment because of my love for my wife. She's everything to me. And so the proper kind of love makes being faithful to the Lord an easy thing. That doesn't say there's not temptation well, in our world. Well, Don, the but Bible says that yeah. it, he, he who finds is, he who findeth the wife findeth the good thing. And and I think, I think that's, almost an un, that's almost an understatement. Okay. <laughs> that's a huge understatement. <laughs> now, right, let, 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 me, let me jump real quick. I got to go back somewhere because I want to ask you something. We were talking about the book of Revelations, right? Now help yep. me out with this, all right? Because I'm not I'm not the scholar, but the book of Revelations was not written until after 70 AD, right? Now, by Wrong. most estimates, right? After, and by most <laughs> estimations, so how can there be no predictions uh for, so that for after 70 AD, right? Because wasn't John what? like a hundred years old when he was in the <laughs> cave? And, <laughs> wasn't he like a hundred years old? No. Okay. You, you've, you, yeah, you've just stated the popular view, and it's the view I was raised with, by That's the way. That's why I'm asking you. I, need, I want to clear yeah. that up. Okay. okay, here's the deal. The book of Revelation was actually written before AD 70 and predicted that event. Okay. Now, here, here's a fascinating thing. The majority of, uh, of quote, scholars, unquote, in, in, in our world today do accept the late date, the 95, 98 date, right? And the majority of believers accept that. And again, that's the way I was raised. I, I never questioned it for years and years and years. However, in the 19th century, when belief in the inspiration and the authority of the scriptures was at an all-time high, the dominant view was that the book of Revelation was written prior to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 and predicted that event. One of my very favorite authors, F.W. Farrar. Uh, oh, man, what, what a scholar he was. In, a, in approximately 1897, F.W. Farrar said, the early dating of the book of Revelation is so clearly and firmly established. Now, I'm paraphrasing, okay? But this is close enough. But the early dating prior to AD 70 is so firmly established and accepted by scholarship that no scholar worth his salt would even think about differing with it. Now, that was a view in the 19th century. The pendulum swung. Okay. But I can tell you this, the pendulum is swinging back right now. I mean, it's not a tidal wave. I'm not trying to give that impression. And by the way, I wrote a book entitled, Who is This Babylon? It is also found on my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Uh, it was positively peer-reviewed in the official journal of the Russian Academy of Sciences some years ago. The, uh, the priest who reviewed it said, it is an absolute shame that this book will not be more widely distributed than it currently is. 
And he said, this book needs to be read, it needs to be considered, and it needs to be accepted. Now, he was a Russian Orthodox priest. He was literally putting his career on the line to say something like that. But in that book, I, I established the early dating of the book of Revelation, meaning Revelation was written well before A.D. 70. All right, now, hold on. Now, now see, you talking about you can't count. Now, let, let, just, let me ask this question. Now. So are you telling me that a chastisement is not coming? Because it seems to me as if men today and all over the world, it seems to me like they're just as evil. We're living in a time that just as evil in the days of Noah. So oh, I didn't are say anything. Say, yeah. are, 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 I mean, so are we saying that Jesus, Jesus isn't coming back and uh, uh, m making people pay for this or what's that? I mean, what are we saying with that? <laughs> right. Yeah, you've said a mouthful there. Point number one, I didn't I need, say I that. I need Jesus to come and give people they come up with. <laughs> now, look, if, if, oh, look. If, if it's not, I, I've gone, I've passed on quite a few things waiting on Jesus to come and bust a few heads. <laughs> Remember, he went into church turning over tables, and I'm like, mm hmm, he coming back. Please, God, help me out here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. point number one. Okay, let's just face number one, uh, the challenge of Christ. Jesus said, if I don't do what the Father gave me to do, don't believe me. John chapter 10, verse 37. Point number two, Jesus said he was going to come back in the lifetime of the first century generation. He said, there are some standing here. That was 2,000 years ago, man. 2,000 years ago. There are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming. Now, let me ask you a question. Do we have any 2,000-year-old people running around our world today? Hello. Not that Hello? we know of. Not that we know. <laughs> you know yeah. what? No. I, no. That, okay. that sounds I, like that I, sounds I like think... asking me what is a woman. No, we don't have yeah, any exactly. Years exactly right. right. Exactly right. <laughs> we got this right. See? Okay. So yes. if we don't have any two thousand year old men running around in our world today, then guess what? That means Jesus came. Now, how did he come? See, we, we tend to think, the way I was raised, Jesus is going to come back one of these days as a five foot five Jewish man riding on a cumulus cloud, descending out of heaven, and he's going to come in flame and fire with a, with a shout, with a trumpet, blah, blah, blah. Listen, the problem here is that you and I were raised. I'm going to use some words. Are you ready? We are raised no. in an Occ Occidental Alexandrian Grecian world perspective now let me explain that we were raised we were raised and this goes all the way back to alexander the great it really does you didn't know this i didn't know this most people today don't know this they're not we're not aware of the fact that when we were in school as little bitty fellas everything that we were taught from was taught from a grecian world view well the problem with that is the bible is written from a Hebraic worldview. And as scholars are increasingly recognizing, the Grecian worldview, sometimes called the Occidental, that doesn't mean accidental, it means Occidental worldview versus the Oriental ver worldview. They're like this. They, they're, they come from worlds apart. Don, listen here, sir. I appreciate you for taking time and coming on the show. I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming here, taking time to clear up some things for us. One of the things that uh, I heard you say on one of your podcasts that I think I'm guilty of is I think sometimes we as people, we become guilty of self-fulfilling prophecies. And I think we have problems with misdiagnosing the Bible. Okay. And I think that we get a little piece of religion and we think that that's the whole movie. We saw the trailer and we think that that we can <laughs> yeah. talk that we saw the whole movie. Okay. And I yeah. think that, you know, one of the things is we are living in some bad times. And I believe personally that I believe it's time for us as Christians to take a stand. Uh, I, I think we need to reach take a stand upon what god said upon his word and i think we need to take back our land 
Sir, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope <clears> you can <throat> come back and see me again. Um, I'll be glad to. Uh, I heard you say uh, before you go. I heard you say on your on another podcast that you also have free literature that people can write to your website and get free literature. You can go to your website and look at some of this literature and look at some of these things that Don is talking about to maybe just try to help us out in this whole thing because we're not going to get it sorted out in an hour in 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> That's but true. Hopefully we'll, That's true. Open, hopefully we'll be able to open up, open up some dialogue. Hopefully somebody will go Absolutely. over to your website and say, you know what? I like the way he talks. I can understand what he's saying and I want to listen to him. Don, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, invitation. It's an honor to be with you. It was an honor to have you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Jim Spiracy. God bless you, and we'll see you again, my friend. I wish I had one of them things like Will Smith had in Men in Black. All right, listen here. Now let's get on with the news. I like to call it news you can use. Or anyway, and, let's, and let, let, let me get on with this. I'm sorry. Hey, for those of you who don't know and you haven't been, you don't know the latest news, prayers go out for Joe Biden. Uh, for those who don't know, Joe Biden scared the hell out of white men all over the world when it was announced that he tested positive for COVID. Honestly, um, one person even admitted, you know, just simply the thought of Kamala Harris becoming president had white men all over America on their knees, all praying in unison. Come on, Joe, don't die on me now, you some bitch. Mm -mm. We don't went through it once. I'll be damned if I go through it again. Hang in there, you some bitch. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. We send out our best wishes to Joe. I know I am. Y'all know the first thing Kamala going to do is put an increase on child support payments. Uh, <laughs> also, um, another thing, this is, this, here, I got a good one for you. Another thing that just really has everybody buzzing and talking about it. Uh, in music news, Beyonce, she surprised her fans by releasing the single entitled Break My Soul. Okay, now you see that uh, we put up a Twitter poll. Uh, we asked the question. We said, uh, "Is Beyonce a, a Illuminati witch? Is she just simply an all-time great entertainer, or is she a role model for little kids everywhere?" You guys, go to Twitter, go to my Twitter page, respond, and tell me what you think. Um, tell me what you think about Beyonce. Uh, also, with the song uh, Break My Soul, in case you don't know, um, Beyonce features uh, Frida. Frida, i.e. Big Frida. Okay, She's featured in that single. Uh, for those of you that don't know Big Frida, I'm going to show you a video of Big Frida. Uh, Frida's going to tell you what it was like uh, meeting Beyonce and working on the video. Tell them, Frida. Still trying to pinch myself to wake up. My manager, you know, called and said that Beyonce wanted to use one of your songs on her new album. I'm like, holy crap. Now, by the way, for those of you that don't know, if you're not familiar with Big Frida, Big Frida's music is called bounce music. Okay, that's what that music is called. So you go, oh, no, never heard of that. Well, it's kind of like the kids list, the music that kids have music that they listen to today, and it's called drill music. 
okay? Drill music is that music that a lot of these little young kids and rappers and whatnot are listening to today. And also this weekend in music, a rapper was just killed um, just uh, this weekend. Put out an Instagram post and told the little Thundercats, yo, you know where I be. You know where I'm at. I'll be at the crib in five minutes. Well, the homies must have got there in four because he died. He was killed less than five minutes later. Okay. Remember back in the day with gangster rap, with Tupac, Biggie. Remember that music? Talking about rolling down the street in my 6'4 while I'm sipping on gin and juice. Meaning that this is a music that describes a lifestyle. Okay. Now, let me ask y'all something. If this is true, if this is a music that describes a lifestyle, okay, if this is true, then why the hell does Beyonce always have to put some type of demonic symbolism or crap in her music, in her video, in her pictures? Why? What's the purpose? Man, Beyonce has almost 25 million Twitter followers. I guarantee you most of them are probably young girls. And let's keep it real. Beyonce has transcended the color barrier. I'm telling you, young girls and women, they look up to this sister. There you go thundering again. They do. And let me tell you this about Beyonce. We used to say the young girls looked up to her. Yeah, young girls looked up to her when they was 14 and 15. Well, guess what? Beyonce's been in the business 25 years. So now them young girls is 35 and 36. Okay. Now, why are you always, Beyonce, why are you always throwing up Illuminati signs and pictures? Why are you always wearing devil rings? And if you was to ask this question to young ladies, women, or even men. Look, man, most of these little girls are grown women. And if you was to say something bad about Beyonce, I promise y'all, man, they'll bring the wrath of a thousand banshees on you. These young girls do not play about you saying anything bad about their queen. Do you know what most women would say if you told them that Beyonce was a devil worshiper? If you showed them that Beyonce was a devil worshiper, you know what these people, what most of these women would tell you? So? Y'all know when I knew what Beyonce was about? Y'all want me to tell you when I knew what Beyonce was about? right here I knew what Beyonce was about when she put when she put the world on notice so y'all don't remember this right y'all don't remember when she threw it up and made the whole stadium go dark y'all forgot that right see we talked about last week talked about things we forgot I think sometimes y'all be getting lost in the matrix I think sometimes y'all we just forget and by the way, y'all do realize that them lights went out. Who won that game, by the way? The Ravens. Ah, ah. Ain't the Ravens, ain't, ain't, ain't the right, don't Ravens always hang out with witches? And if I'm not mistaken, the 49ers was in the lead right before that happened. I could be wrong. Beyonce stopped Colin Kaepernick from getting the Super Bowl. I'm just letting y'all know. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, well, in that case, good. No, not. Listen, man, we remember this. We saw all of this. Okay, now let me ask y'all this question. It's back on Beyonce, okay? Y'all do realize 
something, man. I hate to say this, man. But yes, I do. I do want to say this because I want to get through this crap. But I need, we just need to stop all of this dumbness. Y'all do know that Beyonce has a verse on one of her songs that she speaks of using pages from the Bible to block her menstruation. Y'all do know that, right? Somebody tweeted out about this and called her out on it. And needless to say, the army came down on her about it. Okay. Here's that tweet right here. Take a look. And some, you know, some people said that she was talking about a poem. It was in a poem. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what poem it is. I don't want to read the poem. I don't care. Personally, I think, and I don't know it to be true, sounds to me like it's part of a damn demonic ritual. Okay, I don't know for it to be true, but I bet it is. I'm going to tell you this. I worked in a jail, and I've seen crazy-ass women do that. Now, I don't know why, but I bet you it's some kind of demonic it's something to it. It's a reason for it. Oh, she's just writing that. Whatever poem has that in it, you need to be busted upside your head for even reading something like that. Now, never mind. Hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, let me ask you this here. But never mind. We also, let me ask y'all this question. Has anybody seen Beyonce in this new album? In case y'all don't know, in case y'all haven't realized, Beyonce is on a clear horse. Okay. Now, never mind the fact of how she's dressed. Okay. Never mind the fact of how she's dressed. First of all, she's on a clear horse. No. That's not a clear horse. That's a pale horse. Okay. But as I said, man, what about the fact of how she's dressed? Okay, I thought this was supposed to be the Me Too era. Remember the women's rights? Women have pride. Women have dignity. Okay, Beyonce, explain that. Or let's just ignore the fact that she's dressed like Lady Godiva riding on a pale horse. But I'm sure that there's no biblical significance there. You know, listen, there's a reason that I said earlier and I was talking about her being on a pale horse. See, they say that she's the queen and that is the sixth song on her album. And now here we are on our sixth show talking about it. I sure as hell hope I don't end up having a six kid this week because this could be bad. Okay, you know, just look at it. What, she's naked on a pale horse? What's the big deal? Nothing, I guess. I guess she's always naked if you think about it. And by the way, I don't know if those of you know about music. Um, somebody told me that Drake has a song out that says, if your woman says that your woman ain't nothing, if your woman ain't on Vogue, right? Now, I don't know exactly what the quote was or how it goes, but it was something like that. Well, guess what? This woman was on Vogue. Here's Bay on a red horse. And she did this back in June. And she always putting some little kind of creepy headdress on her head too. Oh, well, wait a minute, hold it. Was she just on a pale horse? Was she just on a red horse? Well, now surely she ain't got on because I said there was four horses. Was she on a white horse? Damn it, damn it. Damn How the heck? That's that's photoshopped. That's photo. No, that she put that on her webpage. Okay, that's from the movie Black is King, and she's on a black horse. Okay, as, as she got on all the horses. Oh, that was the white horse. Oh, black horse. Ha ha. She ain't on a black horse. Damn it. She's on a black horse. Oh, you just tripping. Why are you re you reaching for stuff? You reaching for stuff. Leave her alone. 
1921, she was on Harper Bazaar magazine. The girl done done all four of the damn horses. Why? You could have got a purple horse, a blue horse. No, you got the white, red, black, and pale. And, and, and just the fact that we just allow this to happen is amazing to me. Or is it the fact that she's handled by, or should I say, that she's married to one of the top dogs in the game, and I'm talking about Jay-Z. And let me tell y'all this right now, these kids love Jay. If I'm not mistaken, they call him Hova, you know, because he calls himself Jehovah, you know. They, 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 these people love to make themselves be a god. Now, when you ask Jay-Z about his wife and her demonic hand gestures, Jay-Z just calmly said, I just let her do as she wilt. Meaning Jay-Z Jay believes in the teachings of Aleister Crowley. And let me tell you something, Aleister Crowley was called the wickedest man in the world. Aleister Crowley is the one that came up with that saying, do as thou wilt. That's the credo of Satanism. Back in the day, they said that if you wanted your record to be a hit, Aleister Crowley and company, they would take the record or the song, said that they had a special room somewhere in the studio or something, that they would take the song up and they would play the song and they would do rituals and they would pray to God, that, or excuse me, God, pray to the devil to cast spells in the music. Pray to the devil to cast spells on the music so that it would entrance the kids. Sounds kind of like exactly what Beyonce and Jay-Z are both doing right now. Both Beyonce and Jay-Z constantly telling you that God ain't real. But they're constantly praying for power from Satan to take over your mind. You know, they, they're operating on the theory of put God out and let us in. Now, I know a lot of y'all love Jay-Z, but here's a little verse from Jay-Z, man. And uh, I think this song is with the ambassadors. And Jay-Z has a voice, this, uh, a verse that says, if your God up there is bigger than my God down here, who shall I fear? Huh? If your God is bigger than my God down here, up there my god down here who should i fear no nah, man and now what jay says and even all of jay's fans and then here's a tweet somebody called jay out on this here's a tweet even asking jay about it and once again you see that uh people defend jay-z just as quick as they defend beyonce now i didn't know this but evidently that's a line from the movie of bronx tales I love that movie. And I don't remember that line. Okay. I remember the line where he told her that if the girl didn't reach over and unlock your door, she's not the one. I remember that line. But of all of the lines in that movie, that if you want to quote that one, if that's you, Jay, you want to quote that line, okay, you go right ahead. By the way, man, let me just throw a couple other names out here, too, because it ain't just Beyonce. It's not just Jay-Z. It's Kanye West. It's Kendrick Lamar. It's Little Nas X. Chris Brown. Rihanna. All of them out here playing demonic games. These kids is out here out of control and loving it. And this is why, if I could just have one wish, if I could just say one thing, man, I just wish that we could just go back to the good old days where we didn't have all of that demonic mess in our music. Seriously, we didn't have to deal with all of that with Michael, did we? Look at Mike. We all love Mike. See you next week I'm on Jim Spears. Give them what 
what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Yeah, are you not in the team? Ain't this what they tell you hustle for? I'm on my gladiator monologues, Russell Crowe. And honestly, I don't see what the fuss is for. You let your money blow and all we trying to do is sow it. Just so you know, this is kingdom biz. No Brooklyn Nets, I think we know who team this is. Come on, come on, and don't forget to bring the kids. And y'all gonna need a different planet just to dream this big. So bring your stacks to the table, and I'ma bring my faith. And at the end of the day, we gon' see who win in this race. This is God is the judge, you probably throw out my case. So do us a favor, get that look off your face. They uh -huh. go like you, spit that fire, got them industry rap. Why you doing that Christian rap? Nobody listen to that. Then I reply with a sigh like I'm missing the fact. I'm trying to spread this holy gospel till my savior get back. I'm yeah. going in one time. These record labels all in my face, trying to forfeit my race. But still I'm going in one time. No matter the opposition I face, staying true to my faith. I'm about to give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Give them what they want, what they need, what they ask for. Well, everything they offer, yeah, I'ma give it back. You can have it. Crossing the world on my back, Mr. Ellis. Huh. I'm trying to get the people what they lacking. That's why I act a donkey on the track. Hit a passion. Who got something to say? You, you wanted to play? Then come running my way and ruin G status is dead. No, ready to go. About to go in, you already know. Got my instructions, now give me your audience. Hand me your mic and I'm ready to blow. Rah. One for the money, two for the show. Three for everybody who encouraged me to go, 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 get it. We finally did it. I ain't never turning back. Shout it, I'm fully committed. Committed to my beliefs. I'm committed to the city. Committed to the streets, I'm committed till they get it. Now people calling my phone check, telling me to not hold back. Bring back that old set. Bet it up, I'm on I'm that. I'm going in one time. These record labels all in my face, trying to flip in my race. But still, I'm going in one time. No matter the opposition I face, staying true to my face. I'm about to get them what they want, what they need. Real quick, yeah. cause this is something all black people say. Yeah. Do we bite? Nah. We talking about Beyonce. Now you want to come back or not? Come on here. Okay, anyway. What do you think about I, I know that she was. That's broke. Oh, but well, we can get them fixed, girl. Don't worry about that. I don't know how I broke them. How did you break them? Was drunk. Huh? You was drunk. Some people think Nancy Pelosi was drunk when she said no. that. Yeah. But you mean like when she went walk, walking around in the beauty salon without a mask on? <laughs> came out talking about, all Americans need to wear you, you, You're a Bills fan? Since OJ was a hero. I don't even want to talk to you. Yeah, everybody, anybody ever told you your dog look like a chupacabra? Nah. No.